Hello, everybody, and welcome to Mind Body Green's beauty podcast, Clean Beauty School. I am your host and Mind Body Green's beauty director, Alexandra Engler. On this podcast, we explore beauty through the lens of well being. And on today's episode, we are going to be discussing sun care. Uh, the summer and spring months are upon us, and for me, that means getting outdoors, but doing so safely. And to have this conversation and, you know, a broader conversation about um, skin cancer uh, detection and early and, and prevention and, and as well as just, you know, some broader beauty trends, I am having on board certified dermatologist, Dr. Shasa Hu. She is an amazing resource down at the University of Miami who uh, specializes in treating and caring for skin of color as well as, um, you know, all things skin cancer and I cannot wait to learn more from her today. I've already had the pleasure of chatting with her once before so I know that we're in for a treat. Without further ado, Dr. Hu, welcome. Thank you so much, Alex. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm super excited to talk to you about things I love. Skin care, skin beauty, skin cancer, skin health. Uh, I'm a associate professor at Department of Dermatology and Cutaneous Surgery at University of Miami. I'm also the co-director of our Skin of Color division, as well as director of our cosmetic division. So thank you for having me today. Well, thank you. And you know, to start the episode, I always love allowing the audience to get to know you a little bit better as well as myself. You know, like I said, we've had a brief introduction, but I still would love to hear your full story and how you found yourself um, it, uh, you know, on on the journey into medicine, what was that journey like? And then more specifically, why dermatology? I'm hoping I'm not going to put anyone to sleep. <laughs> so I'm going to keep it brief and do some highlights. Um, honestly, I don't have anything exciting. My journey to medicine, you know, I was a, uh, a, a immigrant to the U.S. with my parents when I was 14. My uh, mom was a physician a physician scientist, so naturally I gravitated towards medicine. But being a very, you know, I had a strong, independent girl at the time, I really wanted to resist medicine when I went to college. I went to Stanford University. I said, you know what, let me do something different. I want to make sure I want to do medicine. So I actually majored in civil and environmental engineering because I really care about the, you know, like, like loved into like really uh, got into like green earth environmental protection and all that um i really had a good time studying engineering but then at the end of my journey in college I was like you know what it's great but i just don't see myself doing it for the rest of my life uh so i went back to medicine took a year off to do research and that's how i kind of solidified my journey into the whole medical field and speaking of like, you know, what different specialties are and how I chose dermatology, again, um, I wasn't one of those people who like uh, was set to be a dermatologist. Uh, the way I say it is because in my practice currently, I'm getting high school students uh, say, oh, Dr. Who, I want to be a dermatologist. And they're barely like mature, they're in high school. They just got their driver's license. They want to be a dermatologist. But for me at that time, which was like, you know, 20 years ago, I was like, well, I want to explore all specialties in medicine. So I did my uh, rotations and uh, really just want to make sure I want to do something that I would love. I'm very kind of like a meticulous person when it comes to that. Like I be indecisive, but once I make a decision, I go for it. So I chose dermatology after rotating through surgery, through OBGYN, through pediatrics, through internal medicine. I really felt that it resonated with everything I love. I, I love working with my hands. So dermatology is a very procedural field. Uh, I love uh, seeing things. Uh, I'm a very visual person. Uh, being able to diagnose the disease just by looking at the skin uh, was just like something amazing to me. Like, wow, you don't need to order an x-ray. You don't need to order a CT scan. Um, because a lot of things we treat in dermatology is all about pattern recognition, especially in skin cancer, 
uh, also in some of the common skin diseases. So that's why uh, I kind of uh, decided that, you know what, I tried everything, dermatology is really the field I want to uh, go into. So that's how I began my <laughs> journey in dermatology. I have not looked back since. So we've chatted briefly. So I know that you also love skincare in general, you know, not just the more medical side of skin health. You just like skincare. Um, where did that come from? And, you know, what, what spurred that interest? Have you always liked skincare? Has that always been a part of your life? Or is this something that came along with dermatology? Or, you know, how, how did that love happen? You know, actually, that's, uh, that's something kind of like I grew up with. Um, so I grew up in China, Chinese women is all about having that porcelain refined skin. So uh, uh, ever since I can remember, I remember my mom telling me, you need to use a beauty cream. Like, you know, beauty cream is really just like a generic term for like probably some like not so great moisturizer that smells nice. Uh, it usually has like pearls or some herbal ingredients. So I kind of grew up listening to my mom, my grandmother, my aunt talking about beauty cream. Like beauty cream to your face, beauty cream to your hands. You cannot get sun. Sun will age you. So that kind of instill uh, that value in me, sort of like take care of your skin. That's part of your culture. That's like sort of almost like a defining uh, feature of being a woman uh, growing up in that era in China. So that's how I first began uh, my interest in skincare. Of course, like, you know, when I got into high school, I went through the whole like teenager acne. I mean, you're probably too young for this. I don't know if anyone like in the audience remember proactive, like proactive infomercial blasting. Oh, I remember proactive. I do. <laughs> okay. So it's like, wow. Like I would get mesmerized. Three step, step one, two, three, order now, like in, in clear skin in two weeks. So that's like another step up. I got into skincare. And of course, like, you know, in high school, like that's when I moved to the U.S. I was just fascinated with like skincare commercials. Luxema, you see like this super uh, like br like bright, quirky. I don't remember her name, but she was like an actress. And she was doing Luxema commercial. Just look at her skin. I was like, oh, wow, Luxema cleanser. And then, of course, and then you get into Maybelline, like Maybelline and lip gloss. So I think like a lot of women growing up in my era kind of got into the whole skincare, watching TV commercials and reading uh, magazines, <laughs> Teen Vogue or things like, or 16, so Glamour. Yeah. Honestly, I feel like we actually have a lot of overlap because I feel like a lot of those formative memories were very much, you know, how I got interested in beauty. Um, definitely, I remember proactive. I had teenage acne too. And so I would like begged my mom to get me proactive. I was like, order it, please. Me too. I'm like, mom, please. <laughs> I was so excited when I received my first kit. I'm like putting on the steps. <laughs> I was obsessed with it. Oh my gosh. I was like, all I wanted to do was just skincare because I all I wanted to do was fix my skin. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Looking back, I was definitely like doing things that I would not recommend to doing now. But, you know, we live, we learn. <laughs> okay. So what is your beauty philosophy? You know, it's, it's kind of cheesy. Um, it actually goes back to a company that we end up closing. Um, called Be Your Life or Beauty in All. Like we came up, like my partner, who is also a, a dermatologist, my best friend, we uh, really want to do something different for um, the audience, for the public. And that was a few years ago. So what kind of resonates strongly with me is seeing the, our obsession with perfection. Uh, and of course, being a dermatologist, being a woman who has uh, issues, I just realized that that pressure to be perfect is actually not healthy, and nor is uh, even realistic. So I would say, like, appreciate the beauty in everything. Beauty in all is kind of my beauty philosophy because uh, focus on the positive. Don't focus on every single pore. Focus on the functionality of your skin. Don't focus on, like, a little bit of even complexion. Um, that way you have a much happier uh, mental health uh, towards your skin, towards yourself. 
um, that is really the foundation of um, like, I would say like accepting, embracing your own skin and then having that longevity in skincare, like maintain your interest, not getting frustrated uh, and maintaining a healthy habit of skincare. Yeah. I love that answer. And I, I think it's such an important message for people to hear, especially nowadays, because on one end, you know, I think people are obviously so obsessed with beauty and, you know, everyone has like a really intense skincare routine. And on one end, I think that's good because everybody's so educated and, you know, I think it's good to stay educated. But I do think that that's a, you know, on the flip side of that coin is this obsession that can be uh, negative in a lot of the ways that you just said, you know, it becomes an obsession in this way where unless it's perfect, you know, uh, there's something wrong with it. Um, And you start feeling bad about yourself and you get frustrated. And, you know, that's, that's not a way to, to live. And that's not a way to take care of yourself, you know? Not realistic at all. Not real. I mean, from either just the face talking about skin beauty to common conditions like acne, psoriasis, eczema. We all go through cyclic flares because our we live in a very dynamic environment. We're not living in a uh, glass house <laughs> or a, a bubble. Like we're exposed to different stress levels, environmental changes, our diet changes, etc. So. As you pointed out, it's just not healthy to be obsessed with perfection uh, or a standard um, uh, ideal of beauty. Um, I think a lot of times we tend to focus on models with certain type of features, certain type of skin. Uh, like, oh, I don't have oily skin. I hate it. Well, I have dry skin. I hate it. But let's talk about the advantages of having oily skin. Let's talk about the advantages of having fine skin. Uh, rather than I try to always change where you have. Yeah, I love that. You know, looking at the positives of your skin and approaching your skincare from a place of positivity and gratitude, I think is, um, you know, such an important lesson for a lot of folks. Um, As you mentioned earlier, you know, you are the head of the Skin of Color division at Miami. And I want to ask you, you know, why is it so important that we create space for educating and caring for a wide spectrum of skin tones? Like, why is that mission so important to you? Because obviously it is, you know, you've spent your career working towards this. It's a very simple answer. Um, We're just going to see more and more people of mixed race or different race ethnicity. Uh, you know, globalization is uh, inevitable. Uh, we have, especially as healthcare providers, we need to educate ourselves on um, being able to recognize how diseases manifest differently in people with different skin color, different skin type. Uh, especially now, we know that U.S. population is really becoming a very much like diverse, mixed, heterogeneous. Um, I did a lot of uh, my uh, research in melanoma in minority patients, particularly focusing on Hispanics and Blacks. So one of our key talking points on justifying why our research is important is that uh, in the next 20 years, one every four Americans will be Hispanic. And U.S. predicts that more and more will be of mixed race. So Hispanics white, Asian white, Black and white, so forth. So our skin tones are not going to be um, brown, uh, yellow tone, or white. It's going to be all shades of different colors. So we need to stay atop of the curve, if not ahead of the curve, as physicians and as you know, like healthcare information sites to educate consumer, to educate our colleague on why it is important to uh, be all encompassing when we treat diseases and talk about diseases. Yeah. I think you're so right. And it's obviously something that, you know, in the beauty space for a long time, I think that we were lacking. Um, And, you know, I don't want to speak for any other part of the beauty industry, but I I do know that um, from the media landscape, a lot of the advice and a lot of what we talked about came from a perspective of white 
women or men. Um, and that was kind of what the advice was built around, right? And so a lot of the things that we shared um, in beauty media was really focused on, you know, what various skin diseases or, you know, symptoms or signs looked like if you had fair skin, right? Um, which does a huge disservice to one, everybody, but two, you know, a growing population, as as you said. Um, so I think it's such an important conversation that we have. No, it is. I just want to throw in like some really simple, interesting case uh, or anecdotal stories. For example, as you're saying, like, especially in the media and the, until the more recent years, uh, it's all about, you know, skincare for uh, the white Caucasian skin type with some sensitive skin type. Um, but when we treat, um, you know, someone with darker skin type, either African-American or Caribbean descent or even Asian skin, uh, which is what we see a lot in Miami, we're very much a diverse um, uh, location seeing diverse patients. Uh, for example, benzoyl peroxide is a great topical uh, acne ingredient for the typical type 1 and 2 skin, but it can really cause significant inflammation in darker skin type and leads to post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Uh, another quick example, when we talk about dandruff of the scalp, a typical reaction of a dermatologist would say, hey, this is medicated shampoo, wash your hair three times a week. But Without, if if that person, that physician, did not ha have training um, in care for ethnic skin, that's not a, a a very feasible device because a lot of my ethnic African American patients they wash their hair at most once every other week because of the coarse nature, the texture. They a lot of times go to a salon to get hair washed. So some, if you tell a patient with that type of skin care, um, hair to wash their scalp three times a week, they, they may not say anything because they were probably too intimidated to say something to the doctor, but they're not going to follow the instruction. So those are simple, easy like examples we see every day, but that really highlights the importance to be mindful of a, a diverse, like how diverse population require different customized recommendation and diagnoses. Yeah, I love those two examples. And, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll call the beauty media out as I have before is, you know, we still give advice like that. And it's something that, you know, I think that we really could, that everybody just needs to do better at um, and to think broadly. Um, and so education like this is so vital. You know, I think those are two important you know, data points, examples of things that we still get wrong. You know, I want to move on to sun care, um, which, you know, we'll still be talking about all the various ways that, you know, skin cancer can show up on various skin tones. So it's definitely within this conversation. But with sun care in particular, um, you know, let's, let's lay the groundwork. Let's set the scene. Um, we know that skin cancer is on the rise. Um, and we also know that an abysmally low amount of people wear sunscreen every day. Um, this is a frustrating stat for anybody in beauty, I know, um, because we, we try to talk about it a lot and we try to be like, you know, wear sunscreen, wear sunscreen. It doesn't necessarily seem like the message is getting through in a lot of ways. Um, so I'm curious, you're somebody who is dealing with this. You are on the ground. You are with patients. You are somebody who sees the landscape, especially in some place like Miami, where you get a lot of sun. What's happening? You know, what what's happening right now in 2023 that is kind of causing this juxtaposition of we know that we need to be wearing sunscreen. We keep on talking about it. And yet it's not happening. And cancer is on the rise. You know, it's why is this happening? <laughs> right. I think you called out like a very important uh, public health issue because, yeah, uh, when we look at um, like holistically, most people do well from skin cancer except melanoma. So some people say, oh, skin cancer, no big deal. 
But skin cancer is definitely the number one cancer of all sites when we look at the statistics. statistics and it's definitely preventable. If not 100% preventable, you can significantly decrease your risk by using sunscreen. And that has been validated by multiple large population-based studies. So the evidence is there. Um, but as I see patients every day, because I have a clinic that focuses on high-risk skin cancer patients, there's a lot of resistance, particularly actually interestingly in a subset of population where they're very health conscious, uh, but then they're also easily, uh, I would say, swayed by misinformation. Um, so especially in the recent years, there's this, a strong uh, growing subculture where uh, there's a belief that sunscreen is toxic. I spend a lot of time dispelling that myth that the sunscreen is not toxic, uh, it's much healthier to apply sunscreen to lower your risk of skin cancer, and it's also much healthier to take vitamin D supplementation than exposing yourself to sun without uh, sunscreen because a lot of times along with that toxicity theory comes along the theory, oh, you need vitamin D for health. So you need to get sun. You cannot use sunscreen because if you wear sunscreen, you're going to become vitamin D deficient. So those are the two biggest sort of undermining uh, subcultures that kind of uh, uh, kind of sway people's opinion towards sunscreen, and that can be dangerous. Yeah, you know, I think the vitamin D and sunscreen thing um, is certainly super pervasive, but. You know, I, I I'm I don't have the study off the top of my head, but I, I'm sure I can find it and reference it in the show notes for anybody who's curious later. But you know, it's um even if we spent all day in the sun or whatever, we're still not going to get enough vitamin D to reach the levels, right? A hundred percent. Um, I actually did like quite a, a number of studies on vitamin D. So there have been uh, at least several studies worth mentioning. I think it will resonate with the general public. In one study, they studied, uh, they followed migrant farm workers in Florida, as well as uh, farm workers in Hawaii. So Florida, Hawaii, two very sunny places. Um, they found significant vitamin D deficiency in farm workers who don't use sunscreen. So the a conclusion was that even if you work outside on the field eight hours a day in very sunny climates, you can still get vitamin D deficient. Um, and then the second study was, was also very interesting. Um, they looked at a subset of uh, patients with a genetic disorder called xeroderma pigmentosis. So this is a genetic condition where <clears throat> patients are born with a mutation that predisposes them to multiple cancers, including skin cancer. So since birth or since six months of age, they really had to live like a vampire, so to speak. And then they, uh, so the study followed these patients with xeroderma pigmentosis and found that they don't have higher incidence of vitamin D deficiency compared to the general public. Um, and of course, and there's also a lot of other studies supporting that um, our skin's capacity to convert vitamin D from sun exposure declines over age, but our GI absorption stays relatively stable. So again, I had to tell, I give the five minutes lecture to every single patient asking me about the vitamin D. The conclusion is that much safer and much more, uh, uh, I would say, reliable to take your vitamin D than go out in the sun, get sunburn and and potentially skin cancer uh, because of that fear of vitamin D deficiency. Yeah. I mean, such an important point and something that I know that I get asked out, uh, about a lot. So I can't wait to tell people everything that you just said. Yes, please do. <laughs> Okay, so on the subject of sunscreen, um, now that we've established that it's not toxic, I, I want to ask about, you know, what your application advice is, because as somebody who is on the beauty market and I get to see all the new uh, sunscreens that are coming out, I know that there is this like really incredible wave of just really sensorially appealing sunscreens out there right now. And so that's really exciting to me. Like, I love seeing that. Um, I've been testing a bunch for, you know, some stories that we have coming up and I've been loving so many of them. 
Um, I want to ask you, you know, like what, what are some sunscreens that you like wearing? And then two, you know, what, how do you tell people to one, wear it properly? And then two, you know, make sure that they're reapplying because I think that that aspect is kind of challenging for people. No, absolutely. Choosing the right sunscreen can be difficult for patients who have sensitive skin or problem prone skin, like acne skin or rosacea prone skin or skin. Uh, with pigmentation tenses, tendencies like melasma. So I have a little bit of everything. I have, I have acne, I have sensitive skin, I have melasma that I just really work hard on controlling. Uh, so for myself and also for my patients with melasma, um, by the way, melasma is a very common condition affecting particularly women uh, in like sort of like adulthood to uh, like mid 30s to 50s uh it can be hormonal induced and they often get that patches of brown stains uh just in case people don't know what i'm talking about so that's a, a very chronic condition very frustrating for a lot of women particularly of hispanic asian background so uh back to the point of sunscreen i like to use um zinc and titanium uh tinted sunscreen because of my melasma um, because a less sensitivity from chemical ingredient. Additionally, um, I like to use a tinted because data has shown that visible light uh, can contribute to pigmentation in darker skin types. So visible light includes blue light that we're getting from the screen, like light from like the window, from driving in the car. Uh, so to be really comprehensive, uh, a visible light blocker um, can uh, help to minimize melasma. And now, unfortunately, there's really uh, not many visible light blockers out there. So we're talking about pigmentary grade titanium uh, and zinc and iron oxide. So iron oxide is a, a inner uh, chemical or metal that um, has been found in uh, makeup and tinted sunscreen. So it's not going to be listed as an active ingredient. You have to look in the ingredient list, like look down in the inactive ingredient, but that really enhances the visible light coverage uh, of your sunscreen. So uh, so I like to use, you know, titanium, zinc, uh, iron oxide. Um, but if I am going to be outside, I will add, uh, I will actually be OCD. <laughs> and mix my physical sunscreen with a little bit of chemical sunscreen uh, just to get a little bit more UVB coverage. Uh, I'm OCD because I live in Miami, uh, so this might not be applicable or it will be too, uh, uh, too much for a person living in the Northeast during the winter time. But um, I know my skin. So if you feel a little bit heat, you feel like that skin, your skin is turning bit red, you need to probably add a, a more sunscreen ingredients. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then going back to your question about how I recommend patients on selecting sunscreen. Uh, first thing I say, are you happy with your sunscreen? Is your sunscreen SPF 30 or higher? If they say yes and yes, you don't need to change your sunscreen. I, I'm not one of those people like you need to have this brand, you need to have that formula to, as long as it's broad spectrum SPF 30 and you are reapplying when you're like outdoor for more than an hour, that works. Um, but like for people with problem skin, I typically recommend choosing sunscreen that does not have fragrance. So fragrance typically can react with the sunlight and trigger a little bit uh, redness or irritation. When people have acne prone skin, I recommend sunscreen that may you know contain a little bit niacinamide to give an additional uh, benefit for their acne issues. Um, and then again, it all depends on skin type. So I can talk for hours, hours about sunscreen, but my, you know, the basic point is that if you're using it, that's great. And SPF 30 higher, wonderful. Okay. Um, I mean, I can also talk about sunscreen for hours. So you're chatting with the right person. <laughs> okay. We also know that, I mean, sunscreen is a huge element of it, right? But we also know that it's not just sunscreen. Like one thing that I always try to stress to people is like sunscreen is not an excuse to just like go lay out in the sun all day. Like it is not a hall pass. Sunscreen isn't a hall pass. Like you got to be smart when you're in the sun, you know? Yes. 
I want to ask you, you know, how do you tell people to spend their time in the sun? Like, are you wearing, you know, UFP clothing? Are you doing sunglasses? Are you minding what time you're out in the day? Like, what are you telling people? No, that's a great point. I'm so happy you brought it up. Um, because I would have patients who are like avid surfer, they come to me all tanned. They're like, oh, I'm using sunscreen. Why am I getting all tanned? I'm like, why well, I'm getting this pre-skin cancer. It's, as you said, it's because sunscreen is not a hall pass. Uh, even if you reapply obsessively, you will have some breakdown and then get some unwanted exposure. So as you're mentioning, um, we really like to encourage like a comprehensive uh, UV plan. So like a big hat, if it's possible, if you're not really being active, definitely wear your sunglasses because UV also damages your uh, eye, your retina, um, and uh, leads to other uh, problems in the future. And then also UV shirt. I love UPF shirts or rash guards. Uh, they're not dorky at all. You can choose very stylish rash guards. Uh, they, it just really adds a, that additional peace of mind when you're busy, when you're on the water, when you're biking. And then additionally, for my really, really athletic people, I really try to convince them to pick their hours wisely. So middle of the day, a bike ride, like a 10-mile bike ride, it's going to be impossible uh, for my golfers try to choose like the morning hour tea times rather than like midday tea times. It's all about compromise. So if you're going to really be active, then you have to work a little harder at, you know, wearing like protective gear, uh, like there's their hats, they'll have a little back flap to protect the neck, the long sleeve rash guards, spray on sunscreen, without benzene. Uh, so everything counts. <laughs> yeah. And I do want to ask you, you know, this is about balance too. Like I am somebody who is the first to say like, no, like you do need to get outdoors. Like it's summer. I'm certainly going to be sitting in the park. Like I'm going to the beach. I'm doing the things. So like, how, how do you find that balance in your own life? Because I, you know, I don't ever want to be the person who's like, never see the sun, sit indoors all day, because that's not healthy either. That's not healthy. And we do need some outdoor time to be connected to nature, grounding yourself. I totally agree. Um, I think definitely um, there are dermatologists out there who are very uh, strict about sun protection. I'm like young, I think it's about balance. Um, again, it's about, um, choosing right time of the day and i tell patients like you know enjoy your life you want like you know like i go to the beach with my kids and i go to ski trips where my melasma flare up like crazy from sea trips and you know i just have to live with this so um you when you get back from your vacation be a little bit more regimented about daily sunscreen definitely incorporate some topical and or even oral antioxidants if you know you're going to be in the sun uh, and additionally, just kind of be uh, mindful. Like, you know, don't get into a, uh, a point where you're seeing that deep tan glow, like, oh, I feel so good. Because we all know tanning is addictive. I've been there. I was a college student. I did a 20-minute per side roasting. Like, you feel great. You have that golden glow. <laughs> I know. So this is a lot of my patients, like, like, oh, I feel so good when I get sun. It's because sun induces endorphin but you de and a dopamine. So you definitely want to be still be careful. Like, don't get into a situation like, oh, I love that glow. I wish I had that tan back. So go out and get some sun, enjoy your outdoor time, but then like bring it back in. <laughs> no, I love that advice. And I think that, you know, it is about balance because I think it's just really unrealistic to tell people never go outside or, you know, stay out of the sun. It's it's not possible. And I tell people, even if you stay inside in a closed, like no window, no sunshine, you, know, you can still get skin cancer from stuff you did years ago. So not to say that you can 100% uh, it's, it's a losing battle. I'm just saying it's about balance. Like, by avoiding sun at all costs doesn't mean that you're saving yourself from skin cancer. Um, but at the same time, uh, it doesn't mean you should go out and get sun. So it's all about balance, moderation. Yeah. And one of the most important pieces to this whole puzzle is being able to, 
you know, detect early signs of skin cancer, right? And being smart about getting checked and, you know, paying attention to the moles that you see in your body. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about detection. Um, you know, first and foremost, go and see your dermatologist, right? Like how, how often do you recommend people go in and get checked? So I recommend yearly skin check, um, particularly if you have had any family history of skin cancer, uh, if you had a history of tanning bed use, tanning bed is really a, a huge risk factor for skin cancer, uh, particularly melanoma, or if you have had like blistering sunburns, those are risk factors uh, that increase your risk. So if you have any of the above, you should definitely see a dermatologist. Um, and it, it, it's not just looking, it's really about checking. So when we do a full body skin check, it's literally from the scalp to the web spaces in between your toes. <laughs> so head to toe. Okay. And then what do you tell people to look for when they're at home? Like if they're monitoring a mole or something like that, you know what? I, I, there's the ABCs, right? And I, I kind of always forget them, which is terrible of me. Uh. <laughs> oh, no, I actually love to say it's easy. It's actually A. A stands for a spot that has a very asymmetrical border. So the halves don't match each other. B stands for irregular border, so border that looks like a map rather than a uh, smooth border. Uh, C stands for color, so multiple colors, or multiple shades of brown, blue, and even pink. D stands for diameter, so anything that's then uh, larger than the back of a pencil eraser. But then there's definitely a lot of uh, data showing skin cancer can be D. It's not necessarily true, but we like to say it so that to remind people. And the E stands for evolving. So anything that's evolving or changing over time can be suspicious. And then finally, F. F is actually my favorite uh, mnemonic to remember. F stands for funny looking mole or funny looking spot. So anything that looks different from everything else you have in your body can potentially be suspicious. Uh, and a lot of times my patients resonate more with F, like the funny looking mole, because our brain... Uh, it's all about pattern recognition. Um, we make these pattern recognition within milliseconds. So this is why a lot of times people come in, this just looks funny, this looks weird. Uh, they can't really articulate. It may, not, it may not even fit the ABCDs. Like it may not be large, it may not have multiple color. It just looked off. So that actually a lot of times has been found to be a, a rather sensitive sign of early skin cancer, just something funky, something different. Um, and of course, if you have a spot that bleeds for no reason, like you haven't traumatized it, it just keeps scabbing. Or if you have a mole that all of a sudden become itchy and then you haven't really like irritated it. So those are symptoms that can potentially uh, signal like a uh, early skin cancer. Um, so when in doubt, definitely see a dermatologist. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, great things to look for. Uh, speaking of earlier though, you know, we mentioned that, um, skin of color can present different challenges, um, or just different things to be mindful of. Um, and you know, I, I, I feel like a lot of like people who are fair, who are maybe prone to moles, kind of like keep an eye out for this situation. But, you know, we also know that detection is incredibly important for people who have darker skin tones because it often doesn't get um, identified right away, correct? Absolutely. So this is actually a lot of my research uh, highlighted that. Uh, delayed diagnosis of particularly melanoma, which is like the most deadly skin cancer of all, uh, is a real issue in Hispanics and Blacks. Um, what we have found by looking at cancer data registry all over the U.S. was that um, Hispanics and Blacks were twice more likely to have metastatic or advanced stage melanoma. And as you pointed out too, it's a lot of times it's a combination factor they may not so low awareness of skin cancer risk, not having the knowledge is a factor, but also having uh, uh, providers that are not necessarily in tune with issues of skin of color is another potential contributing factor. Um, and, and then lastly, we have just really found that there's just a lot of inherent 
um, healthcare biases, so systemic biases within our delivery system, the way we speak to patients, the way um, Hispanic speaking patients are not able to navigate a healthcare system, um, they may have cultural uh, fears. So that's a much bigger problem that not only affects skin cancer, but also affects cervical, breast, and lung cancer. Um, but as but the bottom line is that skin of color patients have worse prognosis because they're diagnosed a little bit later. Uh, and as physicians, we just really try to uh, put out these messages. No one's immune from skin cancer. Even if you don't burn in the sun, you, you just can't. You can still get skin cancer. Uh, I really want to focus on like, uh, features are, uh, are like more specific for skin of color. For example, Hispanics uh, tend to have melanoma most of their lower lower extremities. Uh, blacks and Asians tend to have higher uh, por- a proportion of the melanoma is located on their feet and or fingernails, also known as acral litigious melanoma. So when we see a patient of uh, skin color, we really need to examine their toes and uh, to- like nails, fingernails, because that's an area oftentimes overlooked. Uh, so it's not an easy issue, but uh, I think the more we talk about it, the more people are more aware, and that's how we make little improvements. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, it's really important that everybody knows that um, – you know, that they're a part of this conversation too. You know, I think that a lot of times, you know, it's, um, it it, it feels like it's, oh, it's only if you burn or, you know, X, Y, Z, but we know that that's not true. No, no. Like it's something a lot of my patients did not even realize when I say it, like, oh my God, it's like Bob Marty, Bob Marty died of melanoma. He actually passed away in my hospital at Jackson Memorial Hospital from metastatic melanoma that started out what he thought was like an injury from playing soccer, like a bruise. Uh, so he ignored it and then it turned out to be a metastatic melanoma. Uh, eventually when he got diagnosed, it was too late. Uh, and Miss Universe, Miss Universe, Diana Torres, he, she also had like a, a rather serious melanoma. She's a, a light Hispanic. She never thought she would get melanoma. So she actually um, was very uh, vocal about raising awareness of skin cancer and um, skin of color um, because, as you pointed out, just not having that knowledge um, delays diagnosis. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, how... Okay, so we know that we can't fully reverse damage, right? Like, damage that's been done has been done, um, unfortunately. However, for people like me, who um, definitely tanned when they were young, what are some things that you tell people um, to, you know, help their skin as they get older, maybe not see as much of that damage start to show up? Uh, You know, are there ways where you can buffer that damage um, that you did perhaps even, you know, decades ago? No, absolutely. So for sure, um, it's never too late. <laughs> never, ever too late. So start using SPF um, right away. Uh, and obviously, you're already doing that. And then secondly, uh, again, skincare does not replace SPF. So incorporating topical antioxidants, topical retinol or retinoids. Um, so these ingredients have solid signs behind uh, them in correcting or reversing to a degree of photo damage that you have gotten from prior exposure. So we know that they uh, can soak up a reactive oxygen species, can repair DNA damage, and so forth. So having a good topical skin care that uh, really focuses on addressing DNA damage will help a lot. And then additionally, um, this is like a little bit more advanced for people who have had like a severe sunburn, who have a strong history of skin cancer in the family, who already have skin cancer. So there's definitely strong data supporting certain supplement, supplement, supplements such as oral nicotinamide, nicotinamide or niacinamide, which is vitamin B3, uh, taking a 500 milligram twice a day can significantly reduce a person's risk for additional 
skin cancer. Uh, so this is something that has been evaluated, published in large population study, focusing on high risk patients or even transplant patients. Uh, so I actually recommend in my practice to a lot of my patients who have had a lot of sun damage and they want to do something extra. So again, this does not replace SPF, but enhances what you do on a daily basis. Um, and then lastly, um, for people who want to go like even like above average, uh, there's a lot of laser, like uh, especially fractional laser, fractional uh, laser, fractal laser uh, can decrease your risk for skin cancer if you have a lot of sun exposure before. So again, this has been published. It has data backing it, and we've seen our practice. Um, so there's a range from skincare, SPF, or supplements to cosmetic procedures. So, so there's op- tons of options to choose from. Okay, so there's hope. <laughs> Okay. 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 Good. And, you know, my damage was a few, you know, back when I was a teen and I've learned my lesson. I'm not out there baking anymore, but you know, I, there's those days where I like look at myself in the mirror and I see the, you know, the wrinkles and the dark spots. And I'm like, that was me at 16, not knowing any better. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I think we all gone through that stage. I know. You have to, right? Right. You live and learn. Yeah. Um, Okay. So I wanted to quickly ask you, because, you know, you mentioned you love skincare and you are somebody who is, you know, like I said, on the ground, you're working with a lot of patients, you're kind of surveying the scene, you stay up to date on stuff. What are some skincare trends or what is a skincare trend that you've been seeing lately that perhaps you are not a fan of? Do you have anything that comes to mind? Oh, there's so many things. I want to say that the DIY sunscreen trends, I'm not a fan of. Just like I have had patients coming in with chemical sunburn from the ingredients that have used for the DIY sunscreen causing a reaction. I cannot tell you how much it drives, like how how annoying I get when people talk about DIY sunscreen. <laughs> oh my God, that's terrifying. I didn't even realize that DIY sunscreen was a thing. Maybe, um, I don't know. Is it like a TikTok? It's, it's Miami. It's, it's like a lot of people in Miami, they're like very much like, you know, the, like the holistic type. They want to make their own sunscreen. And then another trend I cannot absolutely stand. I'm, you know, I'm very passionate about it. Is slugging. I cannot stand it when people talk. I mean, I hope you don't love slugging. <laughs> no, I don't like slugging either. Everybody loves it though. Oh my god! I'm like, I'm. That's why I made that face. I was like, okay, okay. I know. I just like it's okay. You only works when you have like really dry skin on your heels or on your hands. But don't do it on your face. I, people come in with acne, with milia, which are little white, tiny white bumps. <clears throat> they get eczema. So it's just really not not safe or beneficial. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, that makes me feel so much better. <laughs> because I feel like I, this whole time, have been like, oh, I don't really like slicking. Maybe it's something wrong with me because everybody else seems to be talking about it. I don't know how they sleep at night. I don't know how their pillowcases don't get dirty and greasy and gross. I, it makes no sense to me. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about what you do do. Um, you know, how you do take care of yourself. Why don't we start with skincare? What What does your skincare routine look like? Um, well, currently, because it's getting kind of hot, humid in Miami, so I really just do like a little bit of simplified steps. So I uh, use a gentle cleanser uh, morning and night. Um, if I wear makeup, I actually like to double cleanse. I do a little oil to wipe off the makeup and then gentle cleanse. Uh, every morning, I do a topical vitamin C. So uh, I currently I'm using skin SkinCeuticals for 10 CF. Um, a C for Lake is another favorite sunscreen. Of, I mean, as vitamin C of mine. And then I follow eye cream. So currently I'm using... Skin Better <laughs> Interfuse, which is a peptide-based technology. Uh, and then I use a brightening serum from Elastin. <laughs> so, it's, so it's like vitamin C brightening serum from Elastin and then my SPF. Okay. Uh, and then at night, I, you know, clean my face. I actually 
do something that I just discovered I'm in love with uh, is actually going against my normal principle because there's no scientific study backing it. <laughs> it's it's a it's like a tiny little bottle. It's kind of pricey, but then uh, I definitely feel a difference in my skin. Uh, it's called plated intensive serums. It's derived from human platelets, so it's more like an exome technology. So I feel like exome is up and coming. Uh, I'm still skeptical about it. So because there's you know a lot of unanswered questions about exosome, uh, like you know human exosome, plant exosome, etc. So plated is a human exosome. Uh, it, it's just a, such a, a small company. I haven't really shown our data. I just got into it from like a friend. I like it. I don't know how it works, but so and now I have like a alpha red, which is like AHA and retinol and a moisturizer. <laughs> so it's a little bit everything. <laughs> I'm so curious about this. I want to check out this serum. Um, it sounds fascinating. You should check it out. I, I have been talking about to all my patients and friends, like, check it out. Let me know. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll have to look it up. I'll give it a go. Um, and then how do you take care of yourself as a whole? You know, we, we believe that everything is skincare. So, you know, from how much you sleep to what you eat. So do you have any well-being habits that you stick to day to day? That's a great question. Um, Honestly, as I have gotten older, I have really becoming like more and more appreciative of sleep. Beauty sleep is not a cliche. That's that's really, really the secret to like healthy life, healthy skin. Um, I just know that I need to get at least eight and a half hours of sleep. If I don't sleep well, I'm cranky, I want to eat more, I want to eat junk food, I get stressed and my skin breaks out and I feel more stressed, I don't want to work out. <laughs> and it becomes a vicious cycle. So I feel like, yeah, when you're a teenager, you kind of thrive on like staying up the night. Out. I think we all went through that stage. But I think like, you know, when you are a little bit more mature, sleep is so important. So I feel like that is during the foundation of health. And then you build upon that with good nutrition, uh, good skincare, and uh, good mental health. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, sleep truly is the basis. I, I'm right there with you. As I've gotten older, I just, it's such a non-negotiable for me, um, which it definitely used to be when I was younger. I was like, I'll be fine. I can, you know, work off a few hours, but not anymore. No, no, like your skin shows because, it, you know, it, it dysregulates everything, your hormones, your stress response, everything. Yeah. Well, this was so fun. I learned so much from you and I feel like I am walking away with some actionable advice and then also some things that I can't wait to, you know, infuse into stories and to tell people about when they ask me about sunscreens and sun protection. So thank you so, so much for coming on and helping us out today. This was so great. It was so fun talking to you, Alex. And I feel like we have a lot of uh, comments <laughs> viewpoints, which is great. <laughs> I think we do too. I think I think there's some overlap here. <laughs> yeah, so um, thank you again for having me. Well, thank you again.